Welcome back to Triathlon Training Explained, powered by Training Peaks. This week, we're going to be looking at bike pacing within a triathlon. Yeah, we're particularly talking about non-drafting triathlon here, where an evenly paced bike leg is thought to have the best end result. But as we all know, that is easier said than done, even with the best intentions. Yeah, I mean, you train hard and then you rest up for race day. So it's understandable that you're going to have that fire in your belly on the day and you, that can end up leading to you over biking. So maybe going out a little bit too hard at the start or putting in unnecessary surges. But how much is this really costing us, if at all, compared to an evenly paced bike leg? What's happening to us physiologically? And how can we prevent it and pace and plan our pacing for the bike better? Now that's why we're here today. We're at this closed road cycle circuit. We're going to be investigating those pace changes. We're then going to be chatting to a physiologist and then we're going to be chatting to an expert in bike pacing. The difference between a well-paced and a poorly paced bike can be very little when you look at the overall average power. In fact, sometimes it can end up looking identical, although it is thought that a poorly paced bike will mean a worse performance, especially when you get onto the run. So the plan for today is for us each to complete a couple of race pace efforts around this cycle track. We're gonna start with a well-paced and evenly paced bike leg as a control and something to compare against. And then we're gonna do another that is poorly paced. Yeah, so we're gonna be riding around this one and a half K loop. It's got several corners. So we're gonna be using those to put in power surges and basically pace it badly. And then we're also gonna start off on the poorly paced leg, going out a little bit too hard, basically doing all the things that we shouldn't do, but we are sometimes guilty of. Yeah, so for each of the efforts, we're gonna do four laps of the track. So around six kilometers, we're gonna track our power, our heart rate, and of course our speed and our time. And we're gonna to aim to hold the same power between each effort or as close as we can to, but obviously how we get to that end power will be very different between each effort. Yeah, and then at the end of that, we'll upload it to Training Peaks and have a look and analyze, but I think it's time to get riding. Number seven. All right, first run, evenly paced. Heather, you ready to go first? Yeah, I'm good. All right, three, two, one. Go, 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 go! Okay, my turn now. Ready, let's go! How did you find that? Yeah, it was all right. How was yours? Yeah, it's quite hard to keep the power well, nice and constant because there's a lot of bends here, so I felt like I was you know, going to exactly surge out of the corners. Exactly the same. And it's also, it's more of a slope than it looks on camera. I think so when you're going down there, you're finding out your watts are dropping and then coming up, they're going like too high. So my yeah. average was pretty good. I was 199 and I aimed for 200, but it'll be interesting to see how little the surges were. Oh, yeah, I, I just was the best Likewise, route. I tried to keep it as uh, the change as little as possible. But before we crunch any data, should we get stuck into a badly paced effort? Yeah, I'm maybe a, this maybe one. a little break first, and then we'll go. For Sounds it. good. Right, I think it's time for another four laps. But this time, we're going to be putting the power down out of the corners and just doing a little bit of surging and basically riding how we shouldn't. Like a bat out of hell. <laughs> oh All yeah. Right, three, two, one, go, Heather. Out for the flames. Ready? Let's go. <laughs> How was it? Yeah. Ouch. Uh, uh, <laughs> 
Yeah, definitely notice how many corners there are. Yeah, so, do you yeah. reach some good highs? Um, I didn't quite catch them all, but I definitely saw it going over 800 a couple of times. So a lot higher peaks than the yeah, 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 so. yeah, yeah, same. I actually quite enjoyed it because it felt like it was kind of bike racing rather than triathlon racing. So you could like get out of the saddle and give it a bit. And then I was like, to make sure I was staying close to my average, I was kind of chilling out down the hill. So. It felt harder physically, but I kind of enjoyed it mentally. If that makes sense. Well, it'd be interesting to see what our normalised powers are and our variable index. So, yeah. should we go and crunch some data? Yeah, let's do that over lunch. Good idea. Right, well, we've come down to Team Bath and we've downloaded our numbers onto Training Peak so we can have a little bit of an analysis. And we've actually, just to make it a bit easier, written them down comparing yours and mine and both our first run and our second run, which is on with the surges. Yeah, so first things first. Um, our average powers are more or less the same between each of the runs. Uh, yours was 200 for the first run, 201 for the second run. Mine was 300 versus 301. So Pretty accurate. Yeah, barely anything in it, more or less the same. But I think it's fair to say it felt very different. Yeah, I mean, run. it's quite amazing how you can still get the same numbers from such different efforts, so to speak. Yeah, so I think what we need to look into now is things like our normalised power, our variability index. Um, so yeah, let's take a look at those so, numbers. Yeah, so I mean, you talked about normalised power, and we'll come on to the actual numbers of that in a moment. But before we go there, can you explain exactly why normalised power is different to average power? What is it? Yeah, so very, very broadly speaking, and I'm brushing over this um, simplistically, um, normalised power looks at those the differences in power. So you might head out for a ride and hold 200 watts, um, very evenly paced, but then you might head out for a ride and you'll surge and your power go 300, 400 watts, but then you'll ride at 100 watts in some ride, still come back with an average power of 200 yeah. watts. But you've actually worked a lot harder on that mm -hmm. second ride, as did we on our second effort. Okay. So that's where a normalised nice. power, it takes that into account. So, so you found your normalised power on your first run was 204, mm -hmm. your second run was 212. So yeah. a significant difference. So difference yeah. The same for myself, two, uh, 305 for my first run, 316. You're even for, bigger difference then. Level yeah, yeah, so that's where it's sort of taken into account that effort change, the, the differences in pace. And that also shows this in the variability index. Okay, go on then. <laughs> so as, again, you're, as, you're, as you're going, Mark. Again, variability <laughs> index just takes into account those pace changes. It's a nice figure that, yeah, just shows that really easily. Um, a very, like the perfectly paced ride, evenly paced, would be a figure of 1.00, and then it would very incrementally go up as, okay. as you the pace has changed. So it's, it's very minute. Well, we um, were both 1.02 on our perfect pacing land. There was a hill and there were corners. So I think that's not bad considering. Yeah. And then your second run was 1.05. And I know that sounds tiny, a tiniest amount, but you would only see points of a difference okay. change. Uh, mine was similar, point zero four yeah. for um, my second run, um, 1.04. So, um, it is showing a, a difference in change, but I do think if we were doing this over something longer than 6K, you would see, it we would probably be 1.1, 1 1.2. 1 yeah. um, so definitely I mean, difference. We can analyze these numbers all day. I mean, we've also got obviously our maximum power. There was sort of significant difference. Yeah, on, two on to three hundred watts too, difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also our heart rates. I thought this might be be an interesting, but actually, I think given that enough, yeah, six yeah. k, we saw one or two beats difference between our um, first and second runs. So um, yeah, really interesting study. I think now we should go and find out about pacing from an expert in this area. So we've popped down to the lab to catch up with the lead applied physiologist here, Jonathan Robinson. Now, Jonathan, now you've had a chance to quickly look at the numbers and you know, there is a difference with the, the surge, our heart rate's a bit higher, our normalised power's higher, but what's happening physiologically to us when we're doing those surges within our ride? I think when you're kind of moving away from the steady state exercise, so holding a, a yeah. certain power output to the more intermittent mm. style exercise, you're going to, in order to generate that higher power, you're going to probably generate maybe a little bit more lactate, start to work more anaerobically, and the body can handle that for a bit, yeah. but if you keep, redo keep doing it, you're going to build up more lactate within the blood and probably start to deplete some of the, the buffers that you've got in the blood's and in the body as well. Even though, because I mean, we were keeping the similar average power, so we were kind of compensating for our surges by backing off more on the other bits, so hence why our average was still similar. Is that still, it's not gonna, you know, make the difference 
it's still going to give your body chance to actually build up the lactic acid because you're not going to have a chance to recover in those in those. Periods. I think it would depend probably on the, the frequency and the intensity. Okay. So if you, you're conditioned enough and you're used to doing that within your training, yeah. your body can probably adapt to some of those and be able to maintain it. Whereas if it's constant on every corner or every hill climb or, yeah. or whatever, then the body's going to get to the point where enough's enough really okay. and you're going to have spent maybe a little bit too much energy and so when it comes to a race situation and you see athletes doing this they might be okay on the bike but then later on when it gets to the run their performance will drop off so you know they've been up there with the bike and it looks like it was fine and it didn't affect them at the time why will it necessarily affect them later on in the race i think there can be a number a number of factors so maybe it is a kind of a build-up of lactate and they might finish the bike stage ahead but they're going to pay the price afterwards or maybe they've used up some of their carbohydrate stores or some of the, the natural buffers within the body which would, would help them. So it's probably a, a kind of a balance of pacing and you know you might want that advantage but don't go too hard and have it as too much of a cost when you get onto the, the next stage after that really. Okay. Right, so now I'm joined by Ryan Cooper, Chief Scientist of Training Peaks and Best Bike Split. Now we've talked about evenly pacing your bike, and that's all very well, but when you get out onto the race course, we all know that probably doesn't happen, particularly when we've got th um, hills thrown in there, different conditions with the wind. So it's where I'd really like to pick your brain, Ryan, um, and utilize your expertise. Now you, um, you're kind of the man behind Best Bike Split, which is a fascinating tool. So I'd like you to kind of explain how it works, what it is. Sure. Um, so basically, Best Bike Split is a, it's basically a race planning tool. And so um, specifically for triathlon and time trial events, um, given a certain goal time or a certain kind of normalized power target, a lot of times people go back to the, the old Joe Friel percentage of FTP um, kind of baseline and say, oh, for an Ironman, I may do 75% of FTP. So if you use that as your goal, um, you can plug those numbers along with some aerodynamic numbers, some numbers about your bike and your weight. Um, and we take the course into account, including the weather. So your hills, your wind, your tailwind, your headwind, uh, to give you kind of a power plan of how you should ride the race to get the biggest benefit. Um, so the biggest kind of best time for the given power and your abilities. So what it's doing, so it's not necessarily just going to chuck out 300 watts for two hours. It's actually going to say, okay, so for the first 10K, when you're on the straight drag into the headwind, you should be holding X amount of watts, and then you're going to turn this corner, hold a different amount of watts, and so on. Exactly. Um, yeah, so, you know, normally the kind of rule of thumb VI-wise is to stay below 1.05. So um, the kind of thought is that you want to keep your normalized and your average power as close as possible. And that's true to, to some extent. Um, but then as the terrain varies or as the wind changes, you actually can gain a little bit of advantage by changing that, you know, within reason. So you're not going to go out and sprint every every straight section and <laughs> or, or every hill. It's pretty much what we were doing. <laughs> and, change, and, you know, vary the effort a little bit within reason. Um, to get kind of a, a bigger bang for your, for your power. Yeah, so I guess like in com if, if we take this back and look at what we did um, on our, our efforts, I mean, we were literally sprinting out of the corners, probably not the smartest thing. And we did see that variability index change and in the region of what you said, but we weren't utilizing anything. We weren't utilizing wind conditions or any downhill sections. So that's where best bike split really comes in to place, really. It's a powerful part. Right. What, what we tend to see is that people, especially in the hilly conditions, they will take the hills too hard. And so even though Best Bike Split would say push your power up on a hill, um, for instance, um, it's what people actually do and what we see is that they push even harder than what we would say. So they find themselves like dialing it back, you know, if they follow the plan on some of these hills, like if you're looking at Kona and you're going up to Javi, a lot of athletes will find themselves actually dialing it back if they're using the plan then when they hit the turnaround, then they have quite a bit more energy to actually pedal down the hill um, as opposed to just coasting and then fighting, fighting the crosswinds coming back. Super. So in terms of the events that Best Bike Split works with, obviously it works by, I assume, um, GPX files or something that are uploaded pre of athletes that have previously ridden or raced on the course. Um, so that, that features quite a few of the Ironman events and challenge events, I believe. 
Correct. Uh, so we kind of crowdsource our courses. We allow anybody to upload, you know, a course from uh, they've drawn with Ride with GPS or any of the other tools. Um, or if they've written the course previously, we'll take that data in as well. But there are certain courses we'll go in and make sure that they're accurate in terms of uh, elevation profile, the distances, the directions. And so for most of the Ironman events, challenge events, we'll go in and kind of verify that those courses are correct um, before we you know, put them out in the wild. Brilliant. Well, it sounds like a really valuable tool. So thanks very much, Ryan. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, that was really interesting from Ryan. I do know it is all too easy to get a little bit carried away on race day, particularly when you've got other competitors around you. Yeah, it is. I mean, knowing that and knowing what's happening physiologically from Jonathan, hopefully when the adrenaline starts to flow, you'll know deep down that no, I need to pace it. And as a result, you'll get a better overall performance and most importantly, be able to feel good when it comes to the run. Well, if you'd like to see more videos from GTN, you can click on the globe and subscribe. And if you'd like to see a recent video of ours on how to pace a hilly triathlon, just click down here. And if you want to catch up on some of our other triathlon training explain videos, they're just here.